This monument here lies in the Galician coast, near the end of our 800 kilometer journey on foot through the northern coast of Spain. These very roads that we will be walking have been walked by pilgrims for over a thousand years, but tens of thousands of years before the first pilgrim established a sense of sanctity to this route, our prehistoric ancestors were doing the same thing. Strangely, they traveled along this very route and performed those activities that make us distinctly human. They traveled inside the deepest recesses of the earth and left their imprint in the form of the richest representations of cave art in the world. Our Paleolithic ancestors were artists like no other. Their paintings leave for us a time capsule of the human soul. In this film, we will follow our quest on foot through the finest caves in this region that coincide with the northern route of the Camino de Santiago. Our encounters will get us closer to our distant ancestors as well as dreamers on the Camino today. Through this, we aspire to gain a deeper understanding of the essence of our human existence. Our journey begins in the autonomous community of the Basque Country, a land that feels and stands apart from the rest of the country. The origins of its people are shrouded in mystery. Their language and customs cannot be traced back to any Indo-European lineage and it still baffles scientists to this day. After walking for three days through villages, beaches and mountains, we arrive at the village of Sestoa. From here, in 1969, two young amateur archaeologists followed a stream through this valley to look for evidence of caves. One of the explorers felt a gust of cool air coming from a hole. They removed a few blocks of stone and they were able to crawl through a narrow tunnel. Around 60 meters from the entrance of the cave, they found themselves facing this. The cave is full of paintings of different animals, painted at different times throughout the span of 4,000 years. For one of the men that discovered the cave, the experience of seeing this panel was so powerful that he has denied visiting the cave ever since. Outside we met with Eidsiver, a museum guide and a resident of a nearby village just beyond the hill behind her. We thought there was no one better to have a conversation with. ¿Cuál es la relación de esta cueva y sus pintores con lo que es el País Vasco hoy en día? Pues nos gusta llamarlos los primeros vascos. Aunque no tenemos ni idea de si hablaban euskera o no, eran los primeros moradores de este territorio. En realidad había gente antes de que llegaran los Homo sapiens hace unos 35.000 años aquí había otras especies humanas pero nos gusta considerarlos nuestros antepasados más lejanos y los primeros vascos y los primeros euskaldunes también por ende se consideraría arte vasca bueno es un tema conflictivo <risa> eh, eh, tendríamos que resolver qué es vasco realmente y a partir de ahí, pero sí es, sin lugar a dudas, es patrimonio mundial, es patrimonio también vasco. Es algo tan exclusivo, tan difícil de conseguir. Me, me sentí muy, muy honrada de estar allí. Es una experiencia, igual es una frivolidad, pero casi religiosa. ¿Era un espacio sagrado para ellos? 
Es una de las interpretaciones tradicionales, que, que las cuevas eran un lugar dedicado a los rituales, a las ceremonias y que las pinturas que hemos podido ver eh, podrían ser un reflejo de esa actividad mágica, ceremonial, ritual por parte de aquella gente. Casualidad o no, resulta que a los humanos parece atraernos mucho el mundo del subsuelo, en todas las culturas, todas las civilizaciones, parece sentirse esa fascinación por el interior de la tierra y bueno, hay relativamente pocas cuevas decoradas comparadas con las cuevas naturales que hay, no pintaban en cualquier sitio, parece ser que elegían algunos sitios específicos para pintar pero sí que los humanos siempre nos hemos sentido fascinados por ese mundo que nos está tan cercano y a la vez tan lejano, que nos fascina tanto pero a la vez nos asusta tanto. Caves of this kind are scattered throughout this route, and people have strolled past and ventured inside them for different purposes through the years. But why? Bueno, eh, supongo que hay un acervo cultural ahí, eh, un pozo eh, del que vamos bebiendo las diferentes generaciones y yo creo que también está marcado eh, por la propia orografía. Al final nos estamos moviendo por valles estrechos, encajonados entre montañas relativamente altas. Son las partes más cómodas por las que podemos transitar. Eh, es más fácil ir por el valle al lado del río que ir por la ladera o por la cresta de una montaña y al final ellos no eran tontos y nosotros procuramos no serlo y utilizar los caminos que ya están hechos. For our nomadic ancestors, traveling through these paths was a way of life. For us today, journeys on foot like these have been instrumental to our understanding of the world and ourselves. It occurred to us that with the demise of nomadic life and the adoption of sedentary lives, humans have been forced to mythologize journeys like these. Is a pilgrimage a symbolic reenactment of our nomadic past? Is this elusive force what drives people on the Camino today? Is walking where we feel at home? We walk for a number of days, following these markers with yellow arrows that guide us before we arrive at one of the hostels where we stay during the Camino. This one here was one of our more special stays, due to our host, Father Ernesto. We felt an immediate kinship to one another because of the intensity of his travels, which he documented in photos. Venezuela, Venezuela, son resúmenes. This room here stores over 80,000 film slides of his adventures. He had spent much of his time traveling in our home country of Venezuela. Maria from the capital Caracas and myself from Guayana. The name is an indigenous word for the land of many rivers. Father Ernesto spent his time working in the gold mines with the local Pemón people and the same river that runs through my hometown. He prides himself in being a traveler, but above all else, a pilgrim. O de aquí a África, o de aquí a la India. Entonces, en, en, en horas has hecho un cambio tan brusco que no te ha dado tiempo a asimilar nada. Cuando tú vas por tierra, aunque sea en coche, vas asimilando mucho más. Y si lo haces a pie, ya sería la perfección. He showed us around the property. We talked to him just outside this decorated secular chapel. Hay un, 
hay un, una afán sin darnos cuenta, nos están manipulando en la com comodidad. Y entonces el camino, el camino es un despertar, puede ser, debe ser, un despertar a otra cosa, ¿no? Un despertar a darnos cuenta de que, de que, bueno, que hay que saber prescindir de muchas comodidades para eh, mantener un, un cuerpo y un espíritu eh, fuerte para hacer frente a los problemas de la vida, porque la vida es un conjunto de logros y de, y de desilusiones. O la llegada de peregrinos aquí, yo lo he entendido perfectamente porque yo he sido peregrino desde muy pequeño, no de Santiago, que para mí Santiago es secundario, es el, es el camino de la vida, y el camino de Santiago forma parte del camino de la vida. Por aparte, porque vaya, si hay que ser fuertes, si hay que ser buenos compañeros, si hay que saber sufrir las dificultades de la lluvia, de asfalto, de las ampollas, eso quiere decir que, que es algo educativo, lógicamente. No por masoquismo, sino por, por, por ideología de que en el camino de la vida vas a encontrar de todo. Y lo del camino es, una, es un fenómeno moderno, moderno masivamente en estos momentos, ¿no? porque ya tiene cerca mil años lo que es el Camino de Santiago. Pero con esta explosión, diríamos, de, de aspecto un tanto masivo, eso es reciente totalmente. Entonces, dentro de una sociedad consumista como la que vivimos, el, el que haya aparecido este fenómeno, este fenómeno pues es algo esperanzador. Esperanzador porque quiere decir que el ser humano no busca solamente la fiesta y, y el comer bien, vestir bien, viajar, eh, busca también algo más. While we agree with the fact that the Camino signifies hope for humanity, the Camino is not immune to the elements of modernity. It may be a futile wish, but we also hope to walk these roads free of internet guides, souvenir shops, and tourism offices. In a way, to us it signifies the end of an era of pilgrims of old in these lands. Back on the road, the Camino took us 55 kilometers west through the beaches and countryside of Cantabria. It wasn't long before we arrived in Santillana del Mar. The inconspicuousness of this little town is misleading. Deep inside a cave in the countryside, one of the most important discoveries in the history of humanity was made. The morning after we arrived, we walked towards the fields, where in 1879, Amateur archaeologist Marcelino Sanz de Sautuola and his eight-year-old daughter Maria were exploring a cave in their own backyard. While deep in the cave, Maria would get down through a narrow passage where she would be the first person in tens of thousands of years to lay her eyes on this. Deep inside the cave, in the main gallery, a herd of bison is painted on the ceiling. Some are standing, others appear to be sleeping. The numerous paintings in the cave were painted in different periods, by different painters, all in the span of 20,000 years. In fact, these are some of the oldest examples of art ever found, dating back some 35,000 years. These bison, however, were the last paintings to be done before the cave stopped being used, making them a sort of epilogue in a dramatic work. The cave was suddenly sealed when the roof of its entrance collapsed humans would have inhabited this area, while the deeper recesses of the cave would be reserved for art and ceremonies. 
Although it is difficult to know the exact reason why they created such paintings, scientists have suggested that there is a fundamental link between shamanism and cave art. The ceiling in the cave is not flat, but it is irregular with cracks, bulges, and depressions. The artists used these bulges and noticeable cracks to give dimensionality to the animals, creating life where there was none, or where it was dormant. Are these paintings an instrument of connection with other realities existing in their beliefs and imagination? We can speculate that to them, this would be a space where there would be no barriers between our world and that of the spirits. A bisonora wall can come to life and speak to us. This is the art of groups strictly bound to nature. They would have traversed this mountain range in their voyages across the country. This gigantic cluster of peaks would separate them from the rest of the country farther west. What did their journeys look like? What drove them into the caves? We continued our journey for a few days before arriving in Riva de Sella. Here, we visited Tito Bustillo, the last cave of our journey. Due to increases in temperature at the end of the last ice age, our species experienced an explosion in population and a flourishing of culture. This burst of cultural expression is most evident here. The cave itself is the largest and most beautiful we visited. Huge decorated chambers with stalactites and stalagmites surround the cave system. Like a reused canvas, these walls have been painted over and over again. The first layer of paint on this panel was done 25,000 years ago, while the most noticeable paintings in the front were done 10,000 years after. This space has remained relevant to our ancestors across incomprehensible timelines. But with so much time in between, will we ever really understand them and what they were trying to convey? We can't seem to comprehend much about the lives of people only 2,000 years ago. But to us, it seems as though they understood each other, even 10,000 years apart. From here on, Maria and I continue to walk for another 17 days through the coastal and inland regions of Asturias and Galicia, before reaching Santiago. We started the day walking in the rain, but as we were arriving in Santiago, the weather cleared. This mythical end of a journey is emotional for everyone, especially for people like our friends, Christoph and Birgit, who 18 years ago decided to start their journey on foot from a little town in Western Germany, all the way to Santiago. We sat down with Christoph, as he reflected on what the journey has meant to him. It was totally incredible, overwhelming. 
yeah, over when we really to accomplish after 18 years, 18 years and six months or seven months to accomplish to be here. And of course, it's something really magical because when you are going on the Camino, you are meeting always people who are also on the same way with a different motivation, with different steps. Everyone has his own planning. Everyone has his own rules with bicycle, with, with luggage, without luggage. So everyone is doing it, but everyone wants the same. So this is something really, which really brings people together and something it's really a mystery because people are doing it since so long time. So I think it's really a magic path really to say, yes, you know how many people went this way all together. And this was fascinating for us also to do the same. For most people, Santiago would be the end of the journey. However, some decide to walk further, to reach Finisterre. In medieval times, this was thought to be the literal end of the world. And so there we stood at the edge of the world, at the end of our pilgrimage. As we watched the ocean and its vastness, something became evident. With so many that have come before us, from our prehistoric ancestors to modern day pilgrims, it became clear to us that these journeys are not isolated from each other. Rather, they have been inherited, and we are but a small portion of a larger human narrative.